we are now officially being recorded. So uh, yeah, so um, I, I will have Paul introduce himself, but he is one of our innovators in residence. He has been really instrumental in connecting us with more innovators who are soon to come with Flagship Friday, one of whom is Hudson Haar uh, with Sky Current. Look him up. You will not want to miss that. And um, as well as connecting us with people like the Starburst Accelerator, which does uh, aviation acceleration. And we will be having Elizabeth Reynolds um, and Paul coaches uh, or works with um, the owner of that incubator. Um, Paul, I'm wondering if you might share a little bit about yourself. Sure. Uh, I am an aerospace engineer, undergrad at Iowa State, of course where, where uh, many great engineers, among other majors, come from. <laughs> um, and I worked at Boeing for about a decade uh, before I came down to Silicon Valley and got a master's degree, graduated in 1999, Internet 1.0, and sort of never looked back, worked for four startups after that. Um, all of them grew just insanely, insanely fast, and I learned so much every single time three of them IPO'd. So uh, after four, uh, I became an investor. My, my goal was to be involved with more than one company every four years, which is all I could do as an operator. <laughs> so since then, I think I, I'm involved with one insanity growing company a year, give or take, um, for the last sort of seven years. That's great. And uh, Paul does a session that we've recorded called um, on pitching which is fabulous and that is available on our website and he will speak to our uh, flagship innovators next year and probably work on a project with us. So we are very fortunate to have him. Today we are going to talk about solutions and last week remember we talked about problems. Today we're going to talk about how to set the stage for good solutions. So as usual, I have some slides to share. I'll share for 30 minutes. And then Paul uh, will kick in and, and share what he has. And so I am going to start by sharing my screen. And uh, if you're comfortable, feel free to share your video. Again, just to orient you, we are radar ready and becoming more radar ready as we go. So let me move my, there we go. Okay. So this week is Solutions with Paul Willard. Next week will be Clayton Mooney on Impactful Outcomes. He delivers uh, le hydroponic lettuce to your door if you live uh, within Iowa and um, has a really terrific business. He will also be doing the Young Entrepreneur Conference, which will occur the uh, 23rd, I think, of October at Iowa State in the Innovation Center. It's a Saturday. And so I will give you more information about that as well. And then after, remember, we uh, have one week off. If any of you wanna meet with me during that week to have a conversation about how you're doing, what you're learning and what you want to learn, feel free to do so. We brought up this quote last week. It's just, again, one of my favorites. Luck is the residue of design. Um, and it was originally said by John Milton, who was a poet. And, but Branch Rickey, the general manager of the Brooklyn Dodgers, uh, gave his interview on uh, for Sporting News. And the idea that luck is a fact, but should not be a factor. So luck as a problem solver is an opportunity. That is the constellation where things happen in, the, in, um, in some sort of alignment, but it also has to do with readiness. So um, being ready is, uh, first of all, understanding our story and then understanding the story of the world in which we're living and what the problems are and for the world in which we're living. So when we think about that, part of our job to tell a good story, which is coming up with a good solution, is being in the right place, telling the right story the right way. So luck stories are about access, awareness, and agility. These are success stories. You hear them all the time. So what, what do I mean by that? I mean awareness. So you're opportunistic, right? And you think about, and you're flexible because you've set this constellation of factors in your environment, which means you have people, you've made connections. 
Think of your connections. Kushi, I think about you, Kushi Kapoor, who met with Dennis Mullenberg and he connected you with resources and helped coach you. And um, Haley, you with Principal Financial Group and Dr. Zhang, um, Ashwin, the same. So when I think about, so those are people that you meet and get to know and you don't wait to get to know them for when you need something. You get to know them in advance of needing something. This is so critical because you don't want people to feel that you're commoditizing them. You want people to feel that you're inviting them into your orbit and you are invited into theirs. Okay, and then technology. Uh, that's um, luck stories are about having access and learning about the right technology at the right time. Next summer, we'll have an innovation ninja program where you will be exposed to all those technologies, coding, AR, VR, um, uh, uh, media, uh, social media, electronic media, um, engineering principles and practices. So uh, it's, it's being aware of what technologies there is and how it empowers you. Then support, right? That's money, of course. Information, access to unique information. Are you listening? Do you get information before other people get information? And how do you use it? And then invitation. Who are you inviting? How are you inviting people to know you, experience you? Because if they know you, they see you, they experience you, they will trust you when you come to them with a solution. So this is the first part. I'm gonna talk about laying the territory for successful solutions. And then Paul can tell you how to have the right one. <laughs> Good luck with that, Paul. <laughs> so how does, how does our solution story go? It's got to be organic. So the first sense of course, Hudson Hart with Sky Currents, he invented the first automated window washing machine at large scale. I asked him about his story and he said, I knew because I saw something and it bothered me immensely. Something isn't right. So then there's a trigger, right? Something that says, Wow, there's a trigger. These people are on scaffoldings and they're not safe. That doesn't feel right. Okay, so we have a consumer problem. We are at liability for these people on scaffoldings. And so there's big motivation and potential to capture value. So then we talk about the impact of that. We measure it. Then we talk about the relevance, unfulfilled needs. Then we talk about a technical solution. So this is a journey. This is how your journey goes. There's a trigger that leads us to be aware of a deeper problem that has an impact that leaves an unfulfilled need, an unfulfilled technical need. We come up with a technical solution and we propose a list of objectives and tasks to complete it. So that solution, that's an organic story as opposed to I have a good idea. Now I'm going to look for places to make it work. Remember, in laying the fabric, stories are fueled and informed by human factors. We talked about this last week. Beliefs, habits, feelings, and experiences. So the more these human factors are, um, are magnified, the more time that we have to do to cultivate security. Because otherwise, a solution will not be accepted, invited, or adopted. In some cases, a solution might be accepted, but not adopted. So somebody might agree to something, but it never happens and it fails because we haven't done the groundwork to make sure these things are addressed. So remember, I keep reinforcing this. This is so important. Experiences drive beliefs, which, impact, which create behaviors, and then basically, that's what creates a culture and of, uh, of how I'm seen in the world. So experience is the one thing that you can give people that will cause their brain immediately to upload. You can't educate them and change their brain. You can't give them more data. You can't tell them what's right and wrong. You can't threaten them, but you give them a different experience, put them in a situation Get them to identify that experience with a story. That's 
when you have an acceptance of a solution. Very important. So uh, one moment, let me move my, okay. So um, how much time to warm up for a solution? How much time does it take? How much introduction time do you have to take in order to create a really compelling solution? Well, if you only have to educate people, in other words, they know you, they trust you, they like you, they've worked with you, they believe in the solution, they need the solution, they're panicked. About 30% of the time, you, it takes you about 30% to warm them up and educate them. But if you are shifting their beliefs, it's gonna take 60% of your case statement, of your business case statement, or your statement to solve the problem is going to be spent creating different experiences if you have to shift beliefs. If you have people that are a little bit untrustworthy or haven't had an experience that you are going to give them with your solution, it's gonna take 60% more of your time up front. So 60% of your business case will be spent convincing them, engaging them, giving them an experience. Now, 90% of your time, if, if somebody has beliefs that really significant beliefs that have to be shifted, things that represent attachment to a feeling or a bad experience or a political um, position or some sort of deep-seated moral value or some sort of deep-seated trauma experience or some sort of um, like group think or for example, certain religious tradition or a certain um, way of voting on legislation, you have to spend 90% of your time making your business case. So my first, if you are gonna focus on solutions, my thought is I always focus on short wins that are really quickly identified and delivered in that situation if people are resistant rather than focusing that, if you're gonna take on a specific belief that is a cause related belief and propose a solution in that climate, you've got to think about, is this worth my time and effort and what am I giving up to do, right? So remember, we're talking about the territory of solutions. So again, change in belief requires deliberate action. So you wanna create receptivity to the, your beliefs to your story and your solution, 30%, typically 30% of your time. So when, it, uh -huh, one moment. So if it can be resolved by education, again, it takes about 30% of your time and effort on your convincing, on the parts of your story that focus on this, there's a problem and we need to solve the problem. But if they need a different experience, again, 60%, which means that you're gonna to have to participate and propose new practices, protocols, tools, and processes as part of your solution. But if it's about attachments, you have to think about, and if you're putting, for example, say you want uh, people to vote for a specific type of legislation and it's, more of a liberal type of legislation in a Republican, in a, in a more conservative community. You have to build into your solution some sort of coaching or counseling or personal compelling relationship engagement in order to change that community. So creating security, which if you want a great solution and you want it to assure its success, you have to think about most solutions, really great solutions that are big ideas, have some sort of distorted reality associated with them. In other words, people aren't doing them because they didn't think it was possible. So if you are proposing a future-based distorted reality solution, a critical part of your proposal for that solution has got to be about creating security. Because in distorted reality thinking and future-based solutions, you are dealing with unpredictability, something novel, untested. People have to be vulnerable. They are uncertain and unfamiliar. 
So again, that's one of those situations. You have to say, where's my solution? How radical is it? Because that's where you have to do more work in creating security. So remember we talked about set, having a set point, secure the environment together, set point. So if you are creating a climate for a successful solution, you want to make sure people feel calmed and validated in their perspectives and beliefs, that there aren't any emotional, physical threats, and you want to make sure that their agenda will be accomplished and that you have mediated any intellectual or strategic threats. So securing the environment also means expertise, right? That you have to create credi credibility, which means that part of your solution will demonstrate I, this, there's technical readiness. I can execute this because I have the expertise. Cultural readiness, this will be adopted because these stakeholders believe in it and resource readiness. I have the tools, the equipment, and the dollars to make it happen. And remember, good solutions demonstrate pre-work in establishing why you and why now. So one of the things when I think about successful solutions, I talk about the visa program, which is creating homeland security, right? So I look at VISA, V-I-S-A, validate, investigate, secure, and act. So if you're proposing a solution, particularly a future thinking solution, it's very important to examine, investigate, and validate the concerns, objectives, or objections, assumptions, barriers that exist. And often the further out your future solution is, the more time you're gonna spend validating and investigating. 70% of your time, when you are solving a problem, whether it's even a simple problem with your roommate or your family, if it is shifting a belief or a pattern or a behavior or a technology, you're gonna be validating and investigating. And then you're gonna be securing and acting, right? So you'll be securing by soliciting stakeholders, securing the resources, and then acting. And that's about 30, that part usually goes easy if you've done the validating and investigating. So that's your visa into success. And when you think about success, what, oh, sorry about that. Um, one moment, please. Um, think about what your roles are. Your roles, it, you're wearing different hats. You are an engineer because you have to demonstrate credibility, be logical and linear, how to do it. You need to be a psychologist because you've got to create motivation and help create anxiety to compel people to solve the problem. And you've got to be a chess player which means you have strategically set up the resources and the timing to do this now. So the people, places, dollars, situation are in place so that you can get your value proposition adopted. So formulating value proposition organizes thoughts that drive solutions which secure confidence. And by the way, with your solutions, that's the back end. As you propose a solution, report, evaluate, report, evaluate, report, and then promote. So don't end with, thank you for the, the money. Thank you for the support. Thanks for agreeing with me, even in a simple conversation where you're solving a problem. But part of your job is to do the after work, not hit and run solution. So that means you have to have as part of your plan, evaluating, and affirming and promoting what you are doing, the solution that you propose. You have to remind people that this worked, that see how well this worked because it validates their investment in it and continues to secure the people who have invested in you. Now, solutions almost always fall into one of these three modes. And sometimes they involve a couple of those modes, okay? 
study, plan, and implement. So study, that causes us to stop. That means we don't know enough to go forward. Plan, that means we might know enough, but um, we have to go slowly because we need to make sure this is gonna come off without a hitch. And then implementing, we need to have the resources. On the back end of that wheel is measuring and evaluating, reporting, promoting, and scaling. Okay, so what does that look like? So think of it this way, problem solution thinking, right? So solution, I don't know. So if the problem is I don't know or we don't know, then the solution is knowledge. If I have knowledge, but I don't have a plan, then the solution is going to be to deliver a plan, a method and resource model. If I have knowledge and I have a plan, then my job is to get the resources and the people in place and a timeline to implement. Okay, so this is very linear. Either I know, I, I don't, or I don't know, right? So you've got to figure out what kind of solution are you proposing? Almost always, especially with students, I see I have a product. So they basically jump to implementation. I have a product, I want to implement it. Here it is. As opposed to really, have I questioned all those assumptions? Do I know my market? Did I create a plan so people would adopt and utilize this product? But often an error is I have a product or I have a cool idea without doing the knowledge and the planning. So when you think about solutions, you are Mighty Mouse. Here I am to save the day, right? That's an old cartoon before your time. Paul, do you remember Mighty Mouse? <laughs> And you have to think of yourself as here I am, instead of saying, I'm gonna throw a solution at you. I want you to invest in my idea. What you're doing instead is surfacing an opportunity, a problem saying, by the way, I can help you. Would you like me to help you? Here's what that help looks like, right? So it's just in time thinking too. Like, wow, right now there's an urgency. So here I am to save the day. It's responding instead of convincing. If you're convincing, you're losing because that gives the other person the leverage. If they're standing like this or they're looking up or they're not making eye contact or their mouth is moving because they're thinking about the next thing to say, you know you're in trouble, okay? It's inviting versus driving, which means remember that visa program, validating and investigating. It looks like you being curious. Because if you're investigating, they're going to give you the answer of how to engage them. So it means better, more, faster, stronger, and smarter. Remember, almost all solutions have an ER on the end as one of their characteristics. Okay? So the mighty mouse factor. Here I am to save the day. So as you look at solutions... Remember we talked about that pyramid up front that talks about once upon a time, there was an industry problem. This was a trigger. This led us to examine that problem, look at the impact, realize that there was an underlying technical problem that had to be resolved. So Hudson, welcome. I had utilized your window washing solution as a, an example of a story, a problem story. And so um, I may call on you to just share a few words if you can at some point. So as we look at solutions, remember solutions have to be specific. So they need to propose a goal and state some objections and then be highly detailed in what methods we're going to use to accomplish those things. Now. There is output and outcome. The solutions are interested as you look at the methods and you're writing your methods, you are thinking about output, those things you can measure and weigh, those qualifications you can measure and weigh, those costs you can measure and weigh. And every task that you talk about in your solution, don't forget to associate it with an output because otherwise why do it? So if you're proposing to solve a problem, Every single task you propose to do in your solution should have a measurable outcome associated 
with the task. All right. And your qualifications should point to why you. Why uniquely me, not just a laundry list of um, irrelevant qualifications, but why me and why now? How, how is this unique situation put together? Part of your call, important thing to remember, particularly for young people, is your qualifications are more than you. Your qualifications are everyone you know, anyone that you have a partner or relationship with, anyone that you could use as a reference, any successes you might have had that have built community or credibility. It's not just you and your expertise. It's your partners. It's your allies. Remember, we talked about that constellation of resources you need to create, that web that um, you can borrow from to encourage people to invest in your credibility. All right. So remember, we talked about the Mighty Mouse part, that most of your work up is up front, 70% of your time is in that psychological and strategic part of your uh, proposal. So a couple notes commonly used in solutions. They are SMART, right? You've heard of SMART goals, specific, measurable, attainable, relevant, and time bound. And so what I think about, these are common areas where people are uh, a trends. And you wanna think about if you're going to solve something, is it actually part of what, uh, part of the compelling narrative of our time? This is particularly true if you want to be in technology. We'll talk about that a little bit more next week with income, um, uh, impact. All right. So one of the things as you build your solution, remember we talked about laying the fabric and this is the Cotter model for change. So what part of your solution includes these elements? And remember, this is especially true if you're shifting beliefs. If you are shifting beliefs, for example, anything that involves that distorted reality, future thinking, solution thinking, so you are shifting beliefs, you're selling air, you're the magic person. So you're gonna have to spend more time doing these elements, being involved in change management, creating the fabric, creating a sense of urgency, creating a coalition of adopters and adapters, right? You're gonna be designing, clearly documenting your vision, your strategy, showing, especially with visual models. Visual models are so important because they communicate faster than people can object. They communicate faster than people can object to what you're proposing because we can take it in at the speed of light. Words we will argue with, we will pick on one, two or three and take a, a position on them. But a visual model requires that somebody take in the whole picture, right? So think about what part of your solution has to incorporate some of these elements. And then give them a vision. Give people some sort of vision that says it's worth the risk, which means you have to understand the risk, which means you've done your visa program, right? Validate, investigate, secure, and act. So it, the further away you're asking people to look, like this is just binoculars. But if you're asking people to look at a solution that is telescope worthy, that basically requires a telescope, you really have to do a lot of that visa, validate, investigate, secure, and act. You really have to create security and credibility in the solution that you're proposing. So how does this look? Remember we talked about the PIP sandwich, persuade, inform, persuade, right? And depending on how much um, engagement you have to do, depending on how much your audience trusts you, depending on how many assumptions you have to shift in order to get people to believe your solution, that's how much time you're going to spend in the first part of this persuasion sandwich, right? So that means that if it's a 
it's a, if it's a visionary, a distortion, a reality distortion solution, you're going to have to spend a lot of time in the first part of this persuasion sandwich. And then also convincing with great credibility and showing enough of your technology in the information part, right? And you're going to have to really blow it out of the water with the last part of the persuasion sandwich, which means you demonstrate with as many metrics as possible, the largest number of people that could be helped by this, the ancillary benefits associated with this and how this is advancing your industry people, places, things, and ideas. So again, we look at our whole pyramid. And remember, you have access to this on the, inner, on the on our student innovation website and the recordings. But as you consider your narrative, I want you to internalize this. Once upon a time, Hudson, I used your example. Something doesn't feel right, right? And once upon a time, something didn't feel right. And I didn't like the way that felt. And this created some sort of technical problem and competition. While other people solved the problem, it still wasn't resolved. We still had liability. There was an impact for this. So that led us to a technical solution. Then we have our methods, our qualifications, our costs, right? This is how we're actually going to get it done. And here is the output of our solution. And then with your benefits and your long-term impact, that's the outcome. That's how you have distorted reality. That's your definition of how you have moved from a current state to a future state. So remember, story questions. Why now? What's at stake and what changes? Minimally, that's your elevator speech. Why now? What's at stake? What changes? Notice when you watch your next movie. If they don't answer these questions, you're disengaged. And I taught fiction writing as well and screenwriting. And it's the same story. Most people make a mistake in that they offer a really cool technology or idea and they forget the biggest leverage they have is creating a sense of urgency and anxiety by saying, why now and why you? Okay. With that, I'm going to do two things. I'm going to briefly introduce Hudson. Hudson, could you introduce yourself? Say hello, because and this is Paul's friend Hudson, and you'll be hearing from him in flagship. Hudson, could you introduce yourself and talk a little bit about what you're doing? Uh, absolutely. Yeah, I'd love to. Um, my name is Hudson Har, and uh, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm buddies with Paul. And uh, we're uh, running a robotics company. We're, we're still in stealth, but I don't mind chatting with a few folks here. You know, it's kind of a limited audience. We decided to, to figure out a way to clean skyscrapers um, with an automated solution. So we, we built a robotic system that, that does just that. And um, yeah, we're really excited about it. And I think we're going to market uh, very soon, imminently. So, and, and to your point on timing, I, I, I did want to just, you said something that I really resonate with. You know, you said, why now and why you? And it's a very classic question that venture capitalists are asking because they want to see what was the shift? Was there a disruptive shift? Was there a technology innovation that made it possible? Was there an industry um, shift that maybe you're picking up on? And sometimes you get lucky. And I did want to share that because we knew some things going in, but we didn't know all things. And when you start talking to customers, which is actually something Paul really encouraged us to do, you learn about their problems. And we learned about a problem we didn't know existed. In fact, when, when we did our call together, uh, I didn't know um, that the regulations were changing. And so we have a bit of a, as, as we've put it, regulatory tailwind. And so that answers that question, why now? So anyways, that's my bit. Um, uh, you will like this, Hudson. Luck is the residue of design. When you said lucky, right? So yeah. that was perfect timing. Paul Fun. Willard, it's all you. Thank you, Hudson, and be prepared. Hudson's gonna be more engaged with our students and just be prepared to um, be excited by his story and his ideas. Oh, all right, thank Paul. you. All right, cheers. Cheers. Okay, Paul, you're on mute so far. Oh, you know this. 
Yeah. When I went to full screen, my mute button disappeared. I had to find <laughs> the other one. <laughs> so hopefully you can see my screen now, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, luck. You know, pe people always ask. I do this big, long pitch when I'm trying to co uh, convince big fancy financial institutions and in, into uh, to invest in my venture capital fund, right? Mm -hmm. And then I'm brutally honest at the end and I say, the real reason you should invest in my fund is because I'm lucky and you <laughs> should enjoy the benefit of that luck. <laughs> but so at any rate, um, Love that. happy to talk today. And like Hudson, I could spend the whole time just talking about aspects of what Karen just said is so it's all so true. It's all so right on. And you'll hear some of it echoed, but um, yeah, the too long don't read. If, if you're about to stop paying attention because I'm not interesting enough, I want to use these first 30 seconds very wisely. <laughs> and so, so pain pills, not vitamins, right? Uh, solutions you can execute quickly. And I mean, you can execute quickly <laughs> and solutions you can sell quickly. If, if those are the only three things you remember, I think you'll be better off than 90% of people that pitch ideas to venture capitalists. So that's a good start. But now I'll go into detail on all of them. I think, I think I already went through this, but um, but this this is the background. I think, think I already covered it in my intro though, but I've been fortunate to work uh, at a lot of great companies um, as well as start my own. Venture, so I wanted to just a little bit of context and framing. I'm going to talk about venture capital fundable solutions because that is what I know. And venture capital isn't the you know, funding method for every solution. It isn't the right one for every solution. It isn't the best one for every solution. And I always like to point out that it's dilutive. It forces you to go big or go home when that may not be best for you or the problem you're trying to solve. It's sort of a one-way trip. It's very difficult to get a venture capitalist off your board if, if you find out later you didn't need it. <laughs> and uh, the venture capitalist has a fiscal responsibility to their investors. So even if they love you, and uh, they, they, their hand may be forced to do things which aren't good for you personally because they need to take care of the money that has been invested and entrusted in them. And, and so that, that's one of the trickier parts about our job. But at, at any rate, on the upside, you know, venture capital is risk tolerant. There's no personal recourse. We won't take your house if it doesn't work out. <laughs> Um, and the, the good ones of us are veterans. We've been through the full cycle end to end a bunch of times. So, so we can often help share experiences. And then uh, the, the connections and the signaling, the signaling, signaling. Man, if there's only one thing that venture capitalists bring you, it's signaling. Uh, if a smart investor invests in your idea, other people will pay more attention because they know that's a smart investor. <laughs> and I was like, Honestly, that's the number one thing that venture capitalists do. We, we like to try to help other ways, but the truth is the most important thing we do is just signal. Um, but for the purposes of this talk, the good news is all these VC lessons are more broad than just VC and they're applicable in some way, shape or form. But I just wanted you to know that that's my lens and, and I'll, I'll try to point out a couple areas, but. And I wanted to characterize a few solutions that, you know, the better mousetrap, right? This is another, this is back from Mighty Mouse, except they still make Mousetrap. <laughs> but at any rate, uh, some solutions are more efficient uh, and solutions that are more efficient. So a more efficient solution is, is just some, something that can do it less expensively, perhaps. Um, yeah, usually less expensively than others. Um, the rule of thumb in venture capital world is to overcome the inertia of the old solution that worked you're gonna to have to be 10 times better <laughs> because otherwise the old solution's working. It's not really that big a problem, maybe. Um, so you gotta save a lot of money before you motivate somebody to take the risk, especially your early days of selling. Um, some solutions enable new markets. And so I'll, I'm gonna use Zipline as my example for that. And Zipline is a robot airplane delivery company. That's actually one of the prototypes hanging behind me. Um, it delivers blood and medicine in Africa and North Carolina right now, soon Arkansas. But anyway, um, the, the Zipline solution, to me, Zipline selling an autopilot that delivers packages via these airplanes. 
Um, now, you could have built an airplane that was remote control and a human could fly it, but you could never afford that delivery to pay pilots to actually fly these planes remote control. And you certainly couldn't afford to pay pilots to fly in a big plane and, and figuring out how to get it there. And so that market just doesn't work. So the instant delivery market, instant resupply in Zipline's case, it was a new market that was enabled that just didn't exist before um, because of the technology. Uh, some solutions are what we call network effect solutions. LinkedIn is the classic example of a network effect solution where every person that joins the network makes it stronger and better and, and they're cumulative. And once everybody's on that same network, LinkedIn, really hard for a competitor to get in uh, because everybody's on LinkedIn. Why would you go? Although I saw a competitor on LinkedIn recently, but that's a different story. <laughs> um, and so, you know, network effects are largely regarded as winner take all. These are relatively modern models, the, the network effect model. Really, LinkedIn was one of the first that we think of broadly. And so it's sort of a tech enabled uh, effect in, in large degree. And then the, the classic for a brand new solution is just the win via brand. And win, win via brand just means you build a solution, other people are going to copy you, but you just need to get out and take the market first. If you can get to, you don't have to get to 60% market share, but you have to get far enough ahead of everybody else that you will be the 60% market share. Classic brands in markets like to split up with the winner getting 60%, the second place person getting 30 and the third place person getting 8%. So if you're going that route, you have to go fast enough if you're gonna be copied that you get to 30% say before anybody else is very far off the ground because then you can assure you get to 60 before them. If that makes sense, what are these like uh, McDonald's, Burger King, Wendy's, Jack in the Box, maybe for four? I don't know. <laughs> Coca Cola, Pepsi, RC Cola. <laughs> There's lots of examples of the 60 38 rule. But at any rate, um, and then venture capitalists will evaluate you on the four T's. I put it down there because it's a, for a sort of a venture capital thing, but it's probably applicable to lots of uh, so solution spaces. So team, TAM, traction, and tech. I'll, I'll spend some time talking about all of those throughout the rest of this. And then the last thing that I just want to say is that you know lifestyle business is not a dirty word to me. To me, to some venture capitalists, they'll say it is. But I, I don't agree. And I've had a half a dozen friends come to me with solutions that were not big enough scale to be venture capital investable. And I encourage them, beg them not to take venture capital money and be forced into go big or go home because the fear is they would fall over. They were solving meaningful problems for real people that they cared about. And they all, all six of them without fail got to a space where they were seven figure profitable annually without a single investor. And, and two of them sold for 20 million plus eventually when they were ready to move on to their next solution. <laughs> so lifestyle business is not a dirty word. It's just recognize that it's one and don't take the venture capital money. <laughs> Paul, Paul yeah. define lifestyle business. Oh, sorry. It's what venture capitalists call <laughs> businesses that can't get to a hundred million run rate and IPO space. Companies that get to a hundred million run rate can IPO at a billion dollar market cap and work for venture capital funds. Um, and so anything that it's, isn't gonna get that big, could still get pretty big, but venture capitalists generally aren't in, interested in. Um, there's a saying in venture capital, you, you, you can 100X with a company with an investment, but you can only lose one X. And so venture capitalists will go put 30 investments down in a, in a typical portfolio, depending on how you do your statistics. And let's say just to make it easy, right? They put 3% of their fund in each one of them, hundred X's. They just made three times the fund. All of their investors are happy. The other 29 can fail and lose every single penny. And they still had a successful fund. But those 29 entrepreneurs, they're not going to be super happy about that, right? <laughs> and so I've never liked that attitude in venture <laughs> capital, but it's real and it's there. <laughs> so at any rate, lifestyle businesses are... Uh, ones that can't quite get that big. So first and most important, and I think Karen said it too, 
solve a meaningful problem. And I'm glad you started with problem too, Karen. This is the classic. And I show Zipline because people think from the beginning, they were like, oh, that's an airplane company. And I'm like, no, it's not. No, it's not. That's a solution company. The problem that Zipline set out to solve, oh, they didn't start with an airplane at all. Um, everybody thinks that they started with an airplane and found a problem. No, no, it's tech, tech finding a problem, solutions finding a problem uh, generally don't work out that great. But um, they started because they were in Africa and they were seeing a, a very avoidable cause of death, which was mothers just after childbirth that didn't have blood and they couldn't get the blood to the mothers fast enough to save their lives. And pretty good number were dying, unfortunately. And now with Zipline in Rwanda, many of the counties in Rwanda, now that they're delivering 24 seven, have had literally zero maternal deaths since they've been operating, which is, I mean, how happy does that make all of us? Um, so both, both for the investors as well as the founders, uh, you know, we couldn't have a more meaningful problem. And, and we're very happy about that. And now we're delivering rabies vaccine and snake anti-venom and all kinds of other good stuff too. So we're solving a bunch more problems, but you always start with one. Yep. And Paul, what I thought was fascinating when you talked about that business is that actually the death rate to these women is less than in the United States. Yeah. Yeah. Rwanda is ahead of us because sometimes in the U.S. we run out of blood too, or a baby's born where there isn't blood nearby. Yeah. <laughs> but not in Rwanda anymore. Um, and then the other thing is, if you really want to grow a company fast and solve a problem quickly, you're going to have to recruit other people. So it's, it's also helpful if it's a meaningful problem to not just you so that you can get people to help you. Pain pills, not vitamins. Pain pills fix a painful problem right now. Vitamins you take and you think it's making you feel better, but you're not really sure and you don't know how long it takes. And, and it's harder to see and feel the solution, um, unlike a, a pain pill. There's a saying in enterprise uh, investing that only the top five problems of any budget even have a chance. And some people say it's the top three. And the basic idea is if you've got this budget that's doing something at a company, they, they can only take on so many changes at one point in time. And they can operate as many things as they want, but they're only gonna take on so many changes at one point in time. And then they're gonna be out of bandwidth to implement and absorb changes. So if you're not solving a top three to five problem of a specific line item on a budget, it's, it's easier to, to sell against a, a line item on a budget than to get somebody to release new budget. Uh, and the sales cycle can be quicker. So that's, that, that is typical wisdom anyway. And then timing is everything. So I've been using a forest fire analogy since before we had fires in California. I kind of hate the analogy now because I'm directly affected by these fires, <laughs> but it's such a good analogy. I can't get away from it. Um, so executable solutions, both buildable and sellable. Most ideas are too early until the one that isn't. <laughs> um, and, and that is a common theme, re really early ideas that can't be executed quickly and cost effectively yet. Mm -hmm. So zip lines could have been built a long time ago. They would have cost a fortune uh, and the business model wouldn't have worked and they would have taken forever. In fact, I made robot airplanes. Uh, I worked for Boeing. Here's a model of one of them called Dark Star. It's a spy plane. So it was solving a problem that we wanted pictures of stuff in Russia. But this thing costs like $70 million and took a long time to design and build and get up in the air. Zipline could never have a business <laughs> making it the way that we did that. Mm -hmm. um, but Zipline hit at a time where laptops had made lithium ion batteries cheap, common and great. Uh, Tesla made direct drive motors cheap, common, great. And mobile phones made all those sensors, cameras, accelerometers and other things again, cheap, common, great. And so they've, they've reassembled them. And I'll get back to that a little bit more later. But um, for venture capital anyway, we like companies that can get from zero to $2 million, preferably in a year, but it could take longer, that's fine. And then triple, triple, double, double, double annually. This is, this is it's practically a meme for us. And 
with that model, if you got to 2 million in your first 12 months, you'll be at $144 million in six years. Now, that's insane. And it's insane to manage, but that's what VC is looking for anyway. So if you have something that's going to take you too many years to get your product out the door and making that first 2 million, there's no way you're going to make that insanity scale as well. It's, it's so execution on the timing is everything. Um, and then the why now, as Karen put before, the, the famous saying, escape to the puck, that's an old Wayne Gretzky quote uh, in hockey world that I don't, I, don't, I don't skate where the puck is now, I skate to where it's going. <laughs> um, and then you find from my forest fire analogy on the page before, a lot of incremental recombinations of things. I just did it for you on Zipline. I took three technologies that were a part of somebody else's solution and I re-smashed them together and I made a solution that instantly delivers blood and medicine uh, in, over long distances very quickly. Um, there's a saying turtles all the way down. It's, it's the idea that we're building all these solutions on the back of the solutions prior. And a lot of times the answer to why now is because they just did that. And mm -hmm. me as an investor, I always, the, the reason I put that, that, oh no, yeah. The reason I put the forest fire picture in, which tree is gonna burn next? The one that's close to the flame or the one that's a ways off? So for me as a VC, I look at what companies are doing well now. How hot are they? How much are they commoditizing a solution? I always like the forest fire analogy because they're scorching the earth and markets behind them as they go, right? But I can watch that fire and I can see where the heat is and then I can say, okay, now what, what's going to be assembled next from, from those solutions? Um, and many solutions uh, are incremental, but combined in ways that are not not obvious, not not obvious. But, but again, you start with the problem and then you try to find those incremental solutions so that you can get to the problem and execute it quickly uh, and effectively. And then secrets. So P Peter Thiel is a famous investor and he says, he says you should have a secret. And the secret is usually about a problem uh, that other people don't realize, don't know about, right? Uh, and so... Like I have a secret right now. I have a secret. Cars are not going to be going on gas too much longer, right? Well, my secret is that when they make gas, there's byproduct chemicals, a whole bunch of them, as a matter of fact. What happens when they stop making gas? How are we going to get those byproducts? What are those used for? What solutions are going to blow up because we no longer have this practically free byproduct of gasoline production, right? So it's an example of some insight and knowledge. Karen mentioned having the insight first and P Peter likes to look at it as a secret because if you, if you know it and lots of other people don't know it or don't feel it the same way that you do, you can have a timing advantage to get out quick. Buildable. Um, so in software world and in robotics as a service world as well, you have to get to what we call an, a minimum viable product, MVP. And so an MVP has to deliver enough value that people will buy it. <laughs> you, you don't want to give away a pilot. People have to buy it and they have to show they're willing to buy before you know you've actually solved an important problem. Lots of people will try free things. That's, that's easier, um, but it doesn't get you where you need to go. And then once you get your MVP out, you start learning from the market because you get feedback. You get feedback from the sales process like Hudson pointed out earlier. And so the market will start teaching you right away if you're paying attention and <laughs> keeping your ears open. And then I always use the analogy of a strip mine and so everybody, not everybody, it's very common for startup founders to come in and say, we have this solution that's going to fix everything. This giant, a whole bunch of verticals in this giant space. We could have done it with ZipMine too, right? We could have said, we're just going to do all delivery and we're going to make delivery faster for everything. And the the trouble is, it's just, it's not the way that you efficiently gain a market. You gain a market by grabbing one vertical and then spreading out. Sometimes they call it the golf tee because, because you go up the golf tee and then it spreads out and you need to win and lock down that one market. Now, hopefully your MVP market is a big one or an important one. One of the most famous MVP markets uh, was PayPal actually, because they got the power sellers on eBay and they, they recognize that they were network nodes that helped them get a network effect going more quickly. 
And once they own the power sellers, everybody else who was trying to get a payment solution out there had to use a different MVP market that wasn't as good. So that's the, that's the other big thing about picking the right MVP and getting in there quickly. So I always say strip mine until you find a gold vein. At Practice Fusion, we rolled out, sorry, it's an electronic medical record software, that, a place that I worked. And we rolled out a solution and we rolled it out at all doctors. The initial solution, the podiatrists love. Mm -hmm. We didn't know this, but there is no way to make money off of podiatrists. <laughs> and so we, we had to learn from the market and we had to go back. Luckily, somewhere a little bit further down the list was GP, general practitioners. And so we went to them and said, like, what do you like? What don't you like? And then we tuned and changed the product so that they became our number one vertical. They were our entry vertical and, and we got our MVP on track that way. And that was our way to, to golf tee and go into one narrow vertical that was well networked. VCs, I think I already talked about this, looking for classically, it used to be hundred million, now it's 500 million, but at, at any rate, and then sales approaches generally are aligned with average selling price. So, uh, if, if you're whale hunting, if you're going for million dollar contracts, you're going to have to do handshakes and, and fly all over the country and meet people most likely. In the mid tail, lead gen, SDRs or sales de designated representatives. This is basically tele telesales, re remote selling, uh, Zoom selling, whatever you want to call it. Um, and then for the long tail where the average selling price is lowest, uh, you can do self-serve, uh, which is a fast way to get out to market. But Regardless, I was back to what you can execute quickly. It's also what you can sell quickly. Because if you exec execute and you build this product quickly, but it's going to take three years for people to buy, you may or may not have a business in three years still. The field of dreams analogy is a famous one for Silicon Valley. And I, I emphasize dreams because we say, if you build it, they won't come. <laughs> You've got to get out there and sell it and distribute it. Uh, and the market's littered with better products that failed. You know, one of my favorite is an old one also that I know Karen will remember Betamax was a superior video recording <laughs> technology that got crushed by VHS. Similarly, Lotus was a bit, way better spreadsheet than Excel, but Microsoft just wiped them off the map, you know? And, and there are on and on and on examples of better products losing because they just got beat by somebody who got out, executed faster and sold faster. <laughs> Mm -hmm. I think Betamax had some good traction too because the Vietnam War was going on and during some events technology and focus market focus shifts to accommodate for the event and this is an important lesson innovators when you think about the best time to innovate is when a culture is in chaos because nobody is really paying a lot of attention and so while everybody is focused on problems and managing and maintaining and dealing with change, what you want to think about is what could I be doing in this time of chaos that would take advantage of advancing? So I think that Betamax is a great um, uh, comment because it did well, Paul, during the Vietnam War. In fact, we were the first family that delivered Betamax tapes to Vietnam to talk to my father. So it was kind of intriguing, but I think that's why it lasted even as long as it did without moving so quickly. Yeah. And you know, one point that I wanted to mention uh, back on execution. So I'm backing up just a little bit, but I, I wanna make sure I mention it because I'm done. But, um, <laughs> and it's just that, that going fast, being able to move fast is such a huge advantage when you're strip mining, especially because it means you can fail more times and get more chances. You only have to get the right market and product once. You only have to get the right solution once. It's almost never does a startup's first solution out of the box end up being what they scale on. So they almost always have to drop a solution and then iterate quickly. And so that speed is huge uh, when you're trying to find a, the right solution for a problem. That, that prototype zip line, not very good aerodynamically, not super proud of it. That's very typical, by the way. Uh, uh, MVPs are famously things that founders and the people who built them are not always super proud of um, many aspects of it, but it was safe and it allowed us to get in the market and start creating value and learn from our customers and get that feedback. 
most important feedback we got from that thing, we wouldn't have got if we didn't do a kind of crummy aerodynamic plane first. And that was that every time there's a blood emergency, doctors order three units of blood. That's what they do. It's what they've always done. We're not going to change things to Karen's point earlier. <laughs> not, we're not changing it to mess with the solution. Well, guess what? That could carry two units of blood. <laughs> so every single emergency, we had to send two planes. <laughs> and when we redesigned the second one, which is a beautiful plane, by the way, and aerodynamically really proud of it. This is a little model of it, but it's a pretty, pretty plane. This one carries three units of blood by yeah. design from the beginning. Yeah. Well, so at I any rate, take advantage. That's... I want to take advantage too. I want to see if there are any questions for you. We typically run a little over an hour, but I want to make sure that students get a chance to ask questions if they have questions. Do you mind if we take a quick break? Oh, no, that's fine. A ask questions. Charlie. Hi, Paul. Um, so indicative of the, the models that you have around you and prototypes behind you, how involved do you get as a venture capitalist in projects and what is the norm? So I am not the norm, um, but, but like Zipline, I've been going to their all hands meetings. So I, Monday morning, I wake up, I drive to Zipline. That's because they have their all hands meeting in the morning. I work there until lunch. I eat lunch with the team. And then I go to, to another company that I invested in called Captivate and I spend the afternoon there. And they all know I'm going to be there on those days. So they can hit me up with anything they want during the time that I'm there. They can schedule me if they have something really important and they wanna make sure they get my time or they can just hit me, it doesn't matter to me. Um, if they don't need anything, I'll just sit there and use, uh, use their Wi-Fi to do my own email and work. That's fine with me, doesn't, doesn't, doesn't matter. Um, that's very atypical. I always ask the founders, do you, do you like that I'm here? And, and they say, oh my God, we love it. We love having you here. And I say, well, would you like one of your other investors to come also? Like, and they say, no, 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 no. <laughs> <laughs> so it's because I spent 15 years working at startups. And I have rules like you're not allowed to make a deck for me. If, if, if you can't show me whatever you're going to show me with stuff you already used for work, then you're not using the right things for work. <laughs> mm -hmm. And I don't want you spending time making a deck or doing a dog and pony show for me. I want you to spend time building your solution. So I'm not the only one that works this way, but it's very rare. It's, it's, it is very rare, but there are a handful of us. There's a dozen or so of us like this. It's yeah. much more typical, sadly, to do a quarterly board meeting and maybe a call in between. <laughs> yeah. I, I think to your point, Nopal, it's also important for the inventors and innovators to define how they work best and to at least ask or invite themselves in and, um, and see if people will be willing. Otherwise, we wouldn't be where we are even with our programming. You know, so you've got to invite yourself in, figure out what you need and how you work best and ask. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. I always, I always say I would like to, I like to be as involved as the founder wants me to be. And, and I've had investments where I came in and I was very helpful early days and they pivoted and they pivoted to an area that I don't, didn't have any experience or work or, or help that I could, and I just wasn't as helpful. And I usually cut back the frequency for, for those. Um, and that's fine. It's fine. It's, that's just how it goes. Yeah. More questions? All right, Paul, can you finish us out a little bit? And, and you know, moral of the story, you know, as you think about uh, the most important things about solutions, what words would you leave us with? Yeah. So uh, st starting with the problem starting with the problem that you want to solve and then designing a solution that is executable in a reasonable amount of time and sellable. So it can be sellable because of price. It can be sellable because of who the buyer is. There are lots of reasons that it can be sellable, but like make something for a grocery store and try to get them to buy quickly. They just don't. They just don't. So if you want to put something in a grocery store, you got to find another buyer that can buy it and put it in the grocery store for you. Does that make sense? 
It does. We have the good fortune, Paul, of being uh, high V actually features a lot of our student product products and they do have good access and penetration in yeah. those stories. We have two students, one is 22 and one is like 26 who sold their barbecue sauce and started doing orders and making profits of 30,000 a month, which was a big deal for a 22 year old, right? Yep. And so, um, yeah, so there, I think that knowing how to, who is unconventional in inviting in young innovators and avenues. Yeah, depending on your market, that can be a, a lifesaver for sure. Yeah. If you're selling to health systems too, there's about, exactly. there's about 40 that are deliberately innovative and buy quickly and the rest don't. <laughs> Grocery stores, Hy-Vee is one of the most innovative that buys quickly. Um, and so, but, but yeah, def definitely some, some knowledge about your market is helpful sometimes yeah. if, you have a, if you have a slow buying market. Yeah. Any other questions, messages, anything else? Paul, I wanna thank you. Hudson, thank you too as well. Um, I really appreciate the time and energy that you spent in putting things together. And of course, you are always welcome to attend our next week. Clayton Mooney uh, started off entrepreneuring by playing poker. And he did played online, online poker for a living and um, entrepreneur at online poker, and then went from there. And he was one of Y Combinator's young innovators last year, which is really hard to get into. And so he'll talk about his story about impact and outcomes. He now has a hydroponic lettuce delivery um, company and uh, delivers um, hydroponic lettuce all over uh, the Midwest. All right, I will see you next week. And, um, and then we will move into July. Can you believe it? Three more sessions in July. And then we will lead into coaching before we start the year because we are all going to be influential in our environment. So good to see you and keep innovating. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. You guys are great. Thank you. Hudson, I will catch up with you. Okay. My, uh, Paul, thank you so much. You were really wonderful. Thank you. Thanks. Yeah. Well, hope it, I hope it's helpful. I, uh, yeah, it is. I try to, to do some these, folks. Yeah, I try to do these short intensive sessions so that we can capture these summer evenings and um, we're going to do a lot more of them. That's great. Thank you. All right. Bye, Karen. Bye.